Hi there, my name is Mike Sullivan. I'm the Program Director of Ballard Medical Services. I'd like to welcome you to this presentation from our series of continuing education for pre-hospital providers. Now, before we begin, there's a few things we need to go over. First off, the information presented in this program is intended for use by trained EMS providers. Also, due to variations in protocols and scope of practice among different states, departments, and agencies, this program may discuss or depict procedures, medications that are not acceptable in your daily use. If you see something in this presentation that varies from your agency's policy, always follow your department's protocols. Also, none of our authors or presenters of this program have any conflicts of interest or financial relationships they need to disclose. We do have documentation of this on file available in our office upon request. While we do our best to make sure that all the content we present is the most current available, participants are reminded that medicine is indeed a dynamic science and thus changes rapidly. So things may have changed since we've written or compiled this program. Please always follow the most up-to-date information available. In closing, if you have any questions about this or any of our other programs, please email us at info at ValorMed.net. Thank you very much and welcome to the program. Alrighty, now that we've got all that legal stuff out of the way, before we get started, let's talk about coffee for a second. If you're looking for a great cup of coffee, you probably want to check out coffeebrandcoffee.com. They're an online retailer, American owned and operated. They have a wide variety of coffees, teas, hot cocos, all sorts of different flavors. They've got all sorts of organic teas. You can get coffee in bean form, ground form, K cups, whatever the your heart desires. I've had several of the different blends and several of the different flavors. Absolutely fantastic. And because they are an American-owned small business, they don't have a big warehouse, so they don't have a big supermarket sales business. They roast it, they bag it, they ship it to you. It'll pretty much be some of the freshest stuff you'll ever get. Definitely highly recommend them. And they've got a promo code out for us now. If you use promo code Valor SDS, you get a 5% discount off any order. So you can save a little money, try some fresh coffee, see what you like. They've always got different flavors coming through on their website. Some are permanent, some are limited time only. And if you look right there in the picture, you can see they've even got, yes, double caffeinated. Definitely a winner around this office. Alrighty, now let's get to class. Hi there, my name is Mike Sullivan. I'm one of the instructors at Valor Medical Services. And in this presentation, we'll be discussing crew resource management. Now, before we get too deep into the program, I want to touch base a little bit about my background. I've been in fire and EMS for about, oh, 25 to 30 years. I've actually taught both fire and technical rescue as well as hazardous materials. I've worked in EMS management and supervision as well as working many years on the road, both as a pre-hospital paramedic as well as a rescue tech. The reason I bring this up isn't so much that I need to vomit my resume all over the place, but I wanted to give you an idea a little bit about my background. Several of the examples I use in explaining this abstract concept are going to be either fire-based or potentially even law enforcement-based. This is again based on my background and kind of where I'm coming from, but it also can show how CRM or crew resource management can be adapted into virtually any aspect of the public safety response model. Alrighty, now let's get on into the fun stuff. Now, the National Registry has outlined quite a few objectives for this program, and we'll be discussing these as we go through. We're going to define crew resource management, explain the benefits of it to EMS and how we can adapt it into the EMS operations and the EMS culture. We're going to state the guiding principles of CRM or crew resource management and briefly explain them and how we work them in. We're going to explain the concept of communication in the team environment using advocacy, inquiry, and appreciative inquiry. We're going to state the characteristics of effective team leaders and effective team members. We're going to explain the use of crew resource management and how this can not only reduce errors in patient care, but make us more efficient and make our lives easier overall. 
Now, when we look at crew resource management, you may not have ever heard of this before, and if you haven't, don't worry, you're far from alone. By textbook definition, crew resource management is the effective use of all available resources for flight crew personnel to assure a safe and efficient operation, reducing errors, avoiding stress, and increasing overall operational efficiency. Now, when we talk about flight crew, this was something that came out of aviation. Crew resource management was originally called cockpit resource management in the aviation world, and it was something that came out years ago. More recently, it's been adapted into not only the fire service, but other emergency services, and many operations in the private sector as well. Now, when we start talking about crew resource management and what it really means, let's look at this story. Now, this occurred back in December of 1978. A United Airlines DC-8 flight from Port was going into Portland with 189 souls on board. That's a total of passengers, crew, flight crew, attendants, everyone else. And there were three individuals in the cockpit. They had an experienced pilot, a first officer, and a flight engineer. Now, in looking at the bios of these individuals, Every one of them had been with the airline well over 10 years, and the pilot had over 27,000 hours of flying time. So these were not rookies, these were not newbies, these were experienced individuals. Now, as they prepared to land in Portland, they went to put their three sets of landing gear down. Now, one of the gear down indicators failed to light. It, depending on which report you read, some will say it was the front landing gear, some would say it was the right side landing gear, um, I've been unable to pull the original report, but anyway, two out of the three sets of landing gear came on with a perfect green light that they were down, locked in place, and totally functional. One set of landing gear did not show as being correctly down, and therefore they decided this was a problem, they were unable to land. They notified the control tower of this, they pulled out of the pattern, and requested a holding pattern where they could troubleshoot the landing gear. Basically of, hey, we're not really ready to land yet, can we make a couple circles around the airport and do a little troubleshooting? Well, as they began troubleshooting, the pilot pulled out the troubleshooting checklists and began going through all of it. At that time, he directed the first officer to fly the aircraft. Eventually, after circling the airport for a while, the plane crashed roughly six miles away from the airport as they were preparing to land. The end result of this was 10 people were killed and 24 were seriously injured. It's interesting to note that the first officer and the flight engineer were both killed in this crash. However, the pilot was injured but did survive. So, of course, with any plane crash, all the alphabet agencies come out, headed up by the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, and they come out with an after-action report. Surprise! The after-action report indicates that the plane ran out of fuel. They went back over the tapes from the cockpit voice recorder, you know, the black box, and they found that the first officer and flight engineer had both informed the pilot that the plane was low on fuel while he was doing the troubleshooting. It also turned out later that the gear was down and totally functional, however there was a problem with a micro switch and or a light bulb that was damaged, and so therefore the light just did not come on, although the plane was totally functional and could have safely landed. So when we look at this, and this is a tragedy, we had 10 people killed, 24 injured, for a plane that ran out of fuel. Okay. Where do we implement crew resource management in this? And how does this, this is one of the big incidents that was in the aviation industry, a big push into it. They started looking back and analyzing how this happened. There were three experienced individuals in the cockpit. Now the pilot had vastly more experience and was the pilot in command of the aircraft. The first officer and the flight engineer, they both were experienced individuals, both over 10 years with the airline, as opposed to the pilot who had about 27 years with the airline. So, pretty much what happened in this and where crew resource management comes in, two of the three people in the cockpit of that aircraft were aware of a problem. They realized that there was a problem. They could hear them on the voice recorder discussing the fuel situation. However, the pilot had become so focused in dealing with his troubleshooting and the landing gear issue 
that either he was not aware of how bad it was, he thought they were low on fuel but not that low, he didn't hear them, he didn't pay attention to what was being said, there was a miscommunication. We really don't know and I don't think we'll ever know exactly what happened. However, in the simplest terms, two out of the three people who were in control of that aircraft realized they were dealing with a major fuel problem. Unfortunately, they were not able to communicate that effectively to the third person. Now, when we ask why, let's look at some of the potential things that can happen in EMS. Let's say we're on scene with an incredibly critical patient. This patient is circling the drain in front of us. And we may have one veteran provider on scene who's a paramedic. We have another veteran provider who's an EMT or an AEMT and a couple of first responders. And they decide the patient needs rapid sequence intubation. The paramedic is struggling to try to get the tube in. It's a very difficult intubation. Maybe the patient's vomiting. And there's all sorts of things going on. And that provider, the paramedic, becomes incredibly focused on the task at hand, establishing an airway. In the meantime, while that provider is so focused on trying to establish an airway and get an airway on the patient, what else is going on? The paramedic may be totally unaware of what else is going on around him. For example, the patient's heart rate may be breaking down, the patient may be becoming hypoxic, the patient may cardiac arrest. And if the paramedic is not aware of that and is not hearing that, there's a problem. The patient could be circling the drain, much as this aircraft was circling the landing zone for a while. However, because of either A, not getting communicated effectively, B, them not receiving the message effectively for whatever reason, we now have a paramedic who's struggling to intubate a patient instead of saying, okay, we've got a problem, we need to stop this intubation attempt, we need to go back, we need to oxygenate, we need to ventilate, okay, the patient's heart rate is breaking down, we may need to do something else, initiate another skill, we may, if the patient is arrested, we need initiate CPR. We may need to put a Lucas device or other automated CPR unit in place. There may be nine or ten other things that need to get done, but if the paramedic in charge is so focused on that one single task item, nothing else is getting done. The reason I bring up the fact that the first officer and the flight engineer did perish in the crash is not necessarily to point that out specifically, but think about this. They were the two that were aware of the problem, and the captain who survived was not aware of the problem. He didn't realize it. And, I mean, he had a lot of guilt in the subsequent years following this from all the accounts of it I've read. Um, we can definitely see in this, we're all in this together. And when we talk about crew resource management, it is everything from possibly being in a situation where even though that first officer and that flight engineer were definitely rookies compared to the 27-year captain who had flown every aircraft United had ever owned, perhaps were they too nervous to actually say, Captain, we've got a problem. Stop troubleshooting and listen to me. We have an emergency situation. We're going to run out of fuel. You know, they mentioned it to him. It was documented on the of cockpit voice recorder. However, at some point, they did not express themselves in such a way that he appreciated the sensitivity or the urgency of the emergency. Now, aviation, much like EMS, fire service, emergency services, there is a pecking order. Um, a lowly flight engineer, even though he's got 10 years flying, or a lowly first officer who's got 13 years flying, when you've got a pilot in command who's got 27 years flying, you know, there's certain things that you just don't stop and you don't tell the big man in charge, stop what you're doing, you're screwing up. And quite frankly, you know, pardon my language, but that's what crew resource management comes into. And it comes into when we realize there's a problem, that one person, that one paramedic who's so gung-ho to get the airway, Think of it, you're a brand new EMT, you've got a paramedic with you who's struggling to get an airway, and it's just not working, and meanwhile, what else is going wrong that he or she is not aware of? At what point do we tell that paramedic, stop, 
Stop your attempted innovation, pull it out, let's drop an OPA, let's start bagging, let's start oxygenating. Um, you've been attempting to intubate for 90 seconds now, that's unacceptable. Would a young EMT be able to do that or be in a position to do that? How about in the ER? Think about this. Patient is there, they're critical, they came in code by EMS. Would an ER nurse who's got one or two years be able to tell the 20-year physician, stop the intubation attempt, we need to ventilate now, the patient sat is dropping. What ramifications would she or she face by telling that ER doctor, look, you're messing up. Doc, that's the wrong dose. Don't do that. And crew resource management is largely gauged towards breaking down a lot of these walls and it kind of explains how we fix things and how we try to use everybody not just having one person in charge yes the fire chief is ultimately in charge on the fire scene and i understand that but if something is going on that's an immediate threat to the life safety of some of the firefighters and nobody thinks to say anything to countermand that chief's bad order for example, telling a crew to go up and ventilate a roof on a roof that's already very bad and already had parts failure, we don't put people on that roof. Telling people to go in and make an interior attack on a building that's 75 to 100% involved without trying to knock it down first. That's a, all good ways of getting our personnel hurt and killed and having, again, been patient care, bad outcomes for the patients. So that's a little bit on where crew resource management comes from. You think about it, they're on that plane too. And meanwhile, a lot of people have speculated that these two individuals, and unfortunately they're not here to tell their story, but these two individuals were on a plane that they knew were running out of fuel, but because of the pecking order, you don't interrupt the captain and tell him to stop his troubleshooting that we're going to make an emergency landing. No, we can't do that because at that point, the protocol and the pecking order was more important. The fact that he was the captain in charge was more important. And so therefore, these individuals perished in an airplane crash where they were the only ones who realized what was going on. And so, yeah, there's a little bit of crew resource management. And again, I think this is really important because we do need to change culture. And this is definitely a cultural shift from a safety standpoint and everything else. Um, another example of this would be, let's say you're working for a hospital-based service and you are asked to take a discharge and you're taking this person home and you look at the address and where they live is up on the side of a mountain and it's very cold, wet, snowy, icy weather outside and you check with resources that are out there on the road and they tell you there's no way you're going to get an ambulance up that mountain. And meanwhile, you get ordered by your supervisor that your job is to take that patient home and you're not going to refuse a call. At what point can we come in and say, based on crew resource management, this call is a no-go. There is no way we should be trying to do this. From what we're hearing on those roads, you know, we shouldn't be trying to do a non-emergent discharge to residents on icy roads with an ambulance. And yet I've known crews to be put in this situation by a supervisor who basically said to them, and I quote, if you refuse the call, you'll be terminated for cause. Well, these individuals were asked to risk their life in bad situations, and the two of them knew better than the supervisor in charge. And again, this is a cultural shift. This is where we need to be able to call a safety stop in some cases, whether it's a safety stop because of an immediate like roof issue in the fire service or icy roads in EMS or again an airplane that's circling it's about to run out of fuel and land in the field killing a bunch of people and at what point do we call a safety stop and say no this can't keep going on so now that we see a little bit of the history of crew resource management and how it sort of gets adapted into the emergency services and public safety sector Let's look at this. Crew resource management, our goals. Number one, let's effectively use all resources to minimize errors, improve safety, and improve performance. When we talk about minimizing errors, we're working on cardiac arrest. The rhythm changes. Somebody pulls out the wrong drug or the wrong dose of the wrong drug, or the calculation seems off. Any provider on scene should be able to say, well, safety stop, we need to check that. And that's how we minimize an error, how we can improve safety. We talked about that. And improving overall performance, 
Maybe you see something that no one else does. Just because you're the one-year-end provider on the team, and I may be the 25-year paramedic on the team, my crew members have always known, hey, look, if you see something I don't see, please let me know. I ain't perfect. And a lot of it comes into humbling up as not only a supervisor, but being able to say, look, someone can see something I don't. We need to optimize human performance by reducing the effect of errors using other people, hardware, and information. I was once told that, you know, I used to carry when I was on the road a cheat sheet of lots of drugs, lots of drug interactions. I had a lot of cheat sheets I carried in a binder with me on the truck. And people used to always joke about it. Oh, that was a crutch. They had everything memorized. And I said, yeah, when it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm dealing with a five-year-old and I'm trying to figure out how many kgs this kid is and what I want to start drug drips at and how I want to mix things, I like having information back up. Nowadays, in the field, most everybody has some sort of phone or computer system they use, you know, <laughs> most of us now have a smartphone. Get apps, look for good apps, develop that. That's all things where we can use people, hardware, and information to optimize our performance and make it better as opposed to saying, no, I've got everything committed to memory because I've got a photographic memory. Our goals in bringing this out. Number one, better teamwork. We're all in this together. Remember, there were three people in the cockpit of that plane. Two died. You know, newly acquired communication and problem solving skills. Getting everyone to have a voice in it. A big part of this is developing an operational philosophy that promotes the team member input while preserving legal authority. Yes, the fire chief is still the fire chief and he or she is ultimately in charge. I've worked for some great chiefs and fire service line officers and EMS supervisors. I've also worked for some that made some really bad mistakes and it resulted in patient care issues, it resulted in accidents, it resulted in problems because he or she could not put their personal uh, ego aside and allow a non-white shirt crew member to make it, you know, comment or to take over. Proactive accident prevention. Anybody should be able to say, this isn't safe, let's stop it. This roof is not safe for us to be up on. This roof is getting spongy. You don't have to be the company officer or the lieutenant or the one wearing the white helmet to say, an office, a roof is bad and we need to get out of here. The lowliest tailboard black helmet firefighter should be able to do that. By the same token, in EMS, we're bringing a patient out of the house. We realize that the steps seem a little bit soft. They're kind of old. The wood's kind of rotten. You know, when who stops and says, whoa, I have a safety issue. I see a problem. The size of this patient on these steps, along with our weight, is not going to work. We need to reevaluate this before we get ourselves hurt. Or is it better to just, like, be, keep quiet and end up dropping a patient and possibly having yourself or your partner have a career-ending injury. Again, preventive, proactive accident prevention is a big part of this. We talked about minimizing errors. This can not only improve safety for the patients, but also the providers. You know, when we talk about drug dosing errors, grabbing the wrong drug, you know, we have all made mistakes. There is not a paramedic out there who has not. I think of one paramedic many moons back who, in a big hurry, 3 o'clock in the morning, was on a call for a diabetic. The diabetic had a sugar of about 30-something, and so this paramedic was working. He was very tired. He probably should not have been on the road that day. However, he went ahead, established an IV, did everything, and um, when he went to administer medication, he administered one amp. However, in his uh, tiredness or in his exhaustion, he did not realize he administered sodium bicarbonate instead of D50. The um, pre-filled syringes, if you're not familiar, are about the same size, and he should have read the syringe. Um, his EMT partner realized after the fact, when she looked at the syringe, and she tried to tell him that um, you had, you know, that he had administered the wrong medication. Uh, however, he um, did not want to hear that, and it wasn't until they physically went out to the truck and looked in the sharps container, and she showed him with a flashlight, look in there, there's no D50 right on the top of that pile of sharps, there's actually a bicarb. You administered the wrong med. Um, 
you know, that can happen. Mistakes can happen. I'm not excusing it. It does happen. It's going to happen. And that's something that agencies have to deal with administratively. However, he was having a hard time accepting that that had really happened until she showed him. In a simple situation like that, well, let's see. The patient's sugar was 30-something. We administered D50. We waited 10 minutes. The patient didn't improve. We rechecked the sugar. It was now 20. And he could not come to the grips with, oops, I might have pushed the wrong thing. She had to actually teach him that. So there was, again, a situation there. Improve safety. It should also improve team performance. And again, by doing this, it's not so much to increase conflict, it should actually reduce the conflict. It should improve communication when all the stakeholders involved. It should increase feedback among everyone involved. It should also allow for better workload management and task assignments. And when we talk about workload management, okay, let's go back to our aircraft incident. The pilot in charge is in process of trying to do this troubleshooting. He can focus on that, but as far as the decision on when to land the plane, or how much fuel, or who's watching the fuel, the other individuals would be empowered to say, look, we're dealing with the fuel issue, you're dealing with the landing gear. By that same token, he could have assigned one of them to go through the checklist. They're all 10-year veterans in the flight deck. They should have been able to have one of the other ones work through those and allow him to focus on flying the plane. A lot of this comes in if you're familiar with the Incident Command System, Division of Labor. Lastly, improve clinical decision making. Okay, I see this rhythm on the monitor. What does it look like to me? If I'm not sure what it is, is there anything wrong with me handing it to a paramedic student who happens to be riding with me that day and say, I'm, you know, I'm not 100% sure on this rhythm. I've only been a medic two years. What do you think it is? Or does my ego prevent that? And my ego, well, I've been a paramedic for two, three years, and that means that I can identify any rhythm 100% of the time, and I always know what's going on in the monitor because, well, you know, I do kind of have this, like, gold patch on my arm that was sanctified by on high, and so, therefore, I can make every decision myself, and, you know, again, you see where we come into. It's okay to ask for help as a lead provider, and it should also be okay as an other provider on this team to interject help, especially in a safety situation for the crew or the patients. So now let's look at some of the more benefits that are related to CRM. Number one, we'll talk about improved situational awareness. Because of the fact that we all have more input, we all can have better situational awareness of what's going on on the scene. All team members should have equal value and input. Yes, there are different people of different certifications and experience levels, but all members of the organization can participate in crew resource management and especially in critical decision-making situations. Now, the key concepts we need to have are A, situational awareness. Everyone needs to be aware of everything. We're going to talk about how decision-making plays in, workload and task management, teamwork, and of course communication, which is incredibly important in order to implement a CRM concept. Situational awareness is defined as maintaining attentiveness to the event. What's going on? Stop. Look at the big picture. It emphasizes the need to recognize situations in the emergency services can be very dynamic and require full attention. So let's look at the intubation attempt. The paramedic is trying to intubate. Now the other crew members can be aware of things that are going on. For example, the patient's O2 saturation dropping, the patient's heart rate dropping, the patient arresting. Again, everyone can be aware of everything and point these things out to the crew member who's having the problem, who's too focused in or tunnel vision, for lack of a better term, on one thing. We'll talk about decision making. Decisions are made based on the information known to the person making the decision. So, if the dispatcher is making the decision that you should take this trip, taking this discharge home up the side of this mountain in a snow and ice storm, their lack of information or poor information can result in a poor decision. They're not aware of what's going on out there. 
On the other side of that coin, excessive information may overload the decision maker. If they're trying to figure out if the road is safe or not, and they've got a list of 2,000 roads that are good and 500 roads that are not, they may have so much information, things may actually not become apparent to them. They may not realize there's a problem. CRM can focus on giving and receiving information so appropriate decisions can be made in a timely manner. What information is appropriate? What information is needed to make this decision? Everybody knows in that scenario that yes, it's snowy and it's bad outside. However, had anyone communicated directly to the dispatcher or to the dispatch supervisor that okay, we're hearing from the highway patrol that that road is impassable right now and therefore we will not attempt to make this discharge home. When we look at workload and task management, tasks should be divided among all members to optimize functioning of the team as a unit. For example, if I'm in the process of trying to intubate the patient, that's great. I can assign my partner. Watch the heart rate. Let me know if it drops. On the other side of that coin, if we work together regularly, they may know that that's going on. So when they see me preparing intubation equipment, checking my blade, checking my end title devices, hooking everything up, hey, you want me to make sure we're watching the heart rate and get the patient on the monitor? Yeah, that would be great. Team leaders and members should recognize and communicate limitations. And again, we talk about lifting, for example. We're trying to lift a large patient and get them out of the house safely. Okay, if we recognize not only our limitations or that of our crew, we need to realize we need more personnel. We need a different approach to this. We need to go out a different door or possibly out a window. You know, carrying a patient out of a second floor via a long staircase that is in an old house may not be safe to do. Is there a better way to do this? Recognize the limitations of your team, recognize the limitations of your equipment and your game plan. And that way, if we realize these limitations, voice them. Don't be afraid to say, look, we cannot do this safely with the people we have. A lot of times we see teamwork being a big push. A failure to function as a team in the emergency services field can be disastrous. Let's take a look at that cockpit incident. We have a pilot who is trying his best to do what needs to be done to address that landing gear issue, but they did not function effectively as a team. There was a communication gap and that resulted in a disaster. So crew resource management emphasizes the team wins as a team and loses as a team. So we build team performance through exercises in working as a group. The big concept taught of leadership followership so that all members understand their role and their place on the team and they can all work together respectfully as a team so that way again they're more efficient. Think about working with a great partner that you work wonderfully as a team with versus working as a partner that you're not that familiar with. Is it that that partner isn't as good or not as intelligent? Maybe. Or maybe it's just a situation that that partner and you have not clicked as a team yet and not built that teamwork and that network. Another key concept we talk about is communication. This is the key to any type of operational efficiency. You know, two heads are better than one, three heads are better than two. I'd rather have six eyes on something than two. Good communication can prevent misunderstandings. Crew resource management can teach people to focus on the communication model. They build the five-part communication model, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but also make sure when we're communicating that we speak directly, respectfully, and respond appropriately. Sometimes responding appropriately can be as important as what was said initially. If somebody feels that bringing something up will get them in trouble or the bringing something out will get them mocked or harassed or teased they won't bring it up they won't mention anything about those saggy stairs or anything else and until something happens and they'll say well I, I didn't think the stairs were that good but i didn't want to say anything because i'd be thought of as lazy or i'd be thought of as well you're just trying to get out of carrying the patient or you just don't want to do your job for example Think about, you know, the transport home. Really? So you're saying we shouldn't take this patient home? Oh, you just don't want to run the call. No, we're saying that it's not safe to run the call. This is a safety stop issue. And again, that's all part of CRM. Understanding that speaking respectfully 
than directly to the person, but also dispatch should be responding appropriately. So the five elements to effective communication, it starts with the sender, the person sending the message. Now there's the message, which is whatever the information is, the core of the information. The medium is the way it gets transmitted. For example, in this, the medium is a video-based lecture. The receiver of the message, that would be you on your end. And whatever feedback, whether it be from a quiz or something else or a progress report. And we need to understand that all those elements are important. Now, effective communication involves transmitting and receiving messages. In some cases, there is a possibility of wrong information being transmitted. And sometimes there's a possibility of interpreting something incorrectly. For example, telling dispatch that we shouldn't be taking this call because of the road conditions. Well, they may dispatch may interpret this incorrectly as you saying you're tired and you want to go home at the end of the day. Look, we've been running like crazy. It's taking forever to get anywhere. We shouldn't be making any more runs tonight because the roads are getting worse. Well, are we saying we shouldn't make the runs because the roads are getting worse or because we're tired and we've been running all day? Sometimes, again, things can get lost in translation. Clarification is needed in both transmission and reception. So at that point, the dispatcher says, okay, are you saying you don't want to take the patient home because you're tired and you want to shut down for the end of shift? Or why are we saying we don't want to make this run? And the person says, no, I'm saying this because Highway Patrol is telling us the road is impassable and therefore we should shut down because of a safety issue. Perhaps dispatch in that situation, and I don't know, the dispatcher was hearing, well, we don't want to make any more trips because we're tired. We want to go home for the night. So again, we need to always be able to clarify both the transmission and the reception of the info. Another big part of good communication is what we call closed loop communication between individuals to eliminate misunderstandings and gain agreement on a course of action. And when we talk about closed loop, that's the same way we talk about in a lot of situations as go ahead and administer an amp of dextrose or go ahead and administer 25 grams of D50. Okay, I understand 25 grams of D50. By that same point, verbalizing it back to make sure that there's no misunderstanding. For example, we may give one milligram of atropine or would we give one milligram per kilogram of atropine? Well, if you say one milligram per kilogram of atropine, that would be a lethal dose. It should have been one milligram of atropine. But again, by verbalizing it back, we can make sure that we're getting it correct. So when we're dealing with a critical communication situation, we start with the opening. Let's say the person is, uh, his name is Josh. Josh, stop. Josh, I'm very uncomfortable with. I'm taking this trip. I think we should pull trucks off until the morning. I think we should pull trucks off the road until road conditions get better. Josh, I'm very uncomfortable with going to the northern end of the county, especially on a mountain road. Highway Patrol is telling us that things are not good. You know, offer a solution and obtain an agreement. What do you think? Do you see this safety concern that I'm voicing? And again, in some situations, we would use a red flag situation for certain ultra-critical messages. Lieutenant, this roof is getting soft. Lieutenant, this roof is going bad. We need to get off of it. And again, that should be a safety stop or a red flag situation. It's very interesting when reading a lot of the CRM materials and a lot of the management materials in developing these programs. In one setting, they actually recommend that an agency or a department develop a certain phrase or a certain word, whether it be safety stop, red flag, critical stop, full stop, whatever that phrase or verbiage is that should be developed. And when one member of the team realizes they're in this situation, they use that and basically everybody stops and listens to them. Consider law enforcement for a minute. If a law enforcement officer is in a high risk chase or in the process of doing a felony um, traffic stop, 
Many times they'll ask people to secure the channel or to stop transmitting on the channel. Or if they're trying to clear or do a room-to-room -room search of a large building, they'll say, go ahead, let's secure the channel. Meaning, the, because their case at that point, their situation is so critical, everybody will stop and listen to them. And it's not because that officer is in charge or they've got the most bars or the most stripes or the most years on their uniform. It's because that officer is in a critical situation. And so therefore, when they ask to secure the channel, their boss shuts up and listens. Because this is a red flag or a safety stop situation. You know, be advised, yeah. You've got a rookie officer who's out with the big bad armed felon who just took down the bank in the next town and is rumored to have a machine gun. He's making that traffic stop. Everybody on the channel needs to shut up and let him have priority on the channel. They're not on scene and there's really nothing they can add to the situation. So developing this code or this phraseology of, look, this is a red flag situation. And when everyone hears that, this is a red flag situation. The patient's heart rate is 30 and decreasing. At that point, everybody should stop and listen. This is a red flag situation. You just quoted a deadly drug dose. This is a red flag situation. The road conditions out here are bad. This is a you know safety stop situation. The brakes on our truck are no good. We have to pull over and stop running calls. You know, things such as this, when you have an ultra critical message, the brakes are going bad on our truck. Our truck is on fire. I've had to put that mayday out over the radio before. That's never a good one, but you know, we had more radio traffic, and meanwhile, dispatch was trying to find out where I was. Other units were asking where we were. Other units were coming across the radio talking about um, get away from the truck in case the O2 cylinder explodes. All very good messages, and I appreciate it. However, at that point, I was trying to put out the May Day that we were on the side of the incident with myself, two crew members, and two patients in the back of the truck with the vehicle on fire. And we were in the process of unloading everybody and trying to get everybody away from the vehicle. And this patch couldn't even figure out where we were or what I was saying because the radio traffic became so heavy when I put out a mayday. So again, think about this. Using red flag situations, yes, it's used in the fire service. It's used in law enforcement. There's also places for it in the EMS. When one crew member realizes we have a red flag situation, Everybody needs to be quiet and listen to them and let them have the floor. It doesn't matter whether it's the newest rookie or the person who's been there 20 years. If they're calling a red flag, they've got something. Now, when we talk about characteristics of effective leaders, they need to be able to create and revise an action plan. They need to come up with an initial action plan, but also be open to revising it. They need to be able to communicate accurately and encourage feedback. They need to hear from their subordinates and the other people on the team what's going right, what's not going right. They should receive and process this feedback. Now, a key part of processing this feedback is reconciling incongruent information. What we mean by incongruent information is, let's take a fire attack. The crew says that they're going in, they're making good progress, they're hitting the fire well, however, conditions on the inside keep getting worse. Well, if you're actually getting water on the seat of the fire, conditions shouldn't be getting that much worse. Something's wrong and we need to be able to analyze that and say what's incongruent. A plus B is not getting us what we should get. Ooh, maybe the fire is in the walls. Maybe the fire is up above our head. A good leader should be confident, but also compassionate, and maintain a mature command presence. They can't be, you know, very easily swayed in many cases. They should be willing to maintain accountability for not only their successes, but the team's success and failure. They should be safety conscious. The fire service has recently pushed a major initiative as far as everyone going home. You know, that should be something that we in EMS need to adapt to as well. They need to assess the situation and modify their uh, tactics accordingly. They need to maintain excellent situational awareness. They need to see the big picture. 
One of the jokes in the fire service for years is, the minute the incident commander starts putting on an air pack or getting ready to put on his gloves, nobody is watching the big picture. Nobody is in charge at that point. That leader is becoming task focused, and so therefore the overall situational awareness, well, it kind of got left at the command post. That leader should be aware with how to use closed loop communication. They should report progress in a timely manner and perform accurately in a timely manner. And a big one, they should treat all members with respect regardless of rank or certification level or length of service or any of the other wonderful things we can get into. And I think everyone can say, as a leader, we can all adapt or improve on one of these things. But how about as a team member? Because not only are we leaders, every leader is also a member of his or her team. And even if you're the chief of the department, you may not always be the chief on every scene. So therefore, you also need effective team members. And we need to learn that. Team members should, again, communicate accurately and concisely while listening to and accepting feedback. They need to exhibit good followership. We've talked about a leader leading his people into battle. Well, the team members need to be good followers as well. The team members should also have good confidence, compassion, maturity. They should be maintaining situational awareness as well. Nobody should have to tell them, hey, look, the roof is getting spongy. They should be aware of it as well. The minute one team member realizes there's a problem, they need to coordinate it to everybody and communicate it. They should maintain appreciative inquiry when potential errors occur. That's the only way we can analyze things and get better. He or she, again, needs to use closed-loop communication, verbalizing back orders that are given. So, you want me to go to the fourth floor and begin a primary search? So, you want me to rig up a safety line rigged off of this line? Whatever the case may be. He or she should report progress on tasks back to the leader, performing these tasks in an accurate and timely manner. Again, be safety conscious and the big one, advocate for safety. Let's look at something simple like using a spotter. If we have a team leader who preaches using spotters and then we have team followers or team members who decide that, well, they're going to tell people, oh, we don't really worry about a spotter. I've been backing trucks up for years. And then we end up having a lieutenant backing into a garage wall. It's happened. They should treat all team members as equals, regardless of rank, regardless of service. They should also realize that everyone deserves to be treated with respect. And they should be able to immediately suggest corrective action if a harmful intervention is ordered or performed by others. For example, if the doctor orders a nurse to give bicarb via the ET tube or to give D50 to a neonatal patient who should really be getting D10, you know, things like that. Everybody in the room has a right to stop that. That's a safety stop. Now, how can we adapt all this into EMS? I've given us a bunch of really interesting examples here. Number one, decisions about how to lift and move patients. Yes, somebody may be a paramedic with 20 years and somebody else may be an EMT with 20 weeks. I get that. However, their safety, their well-being, as well as the patient's safety and well-being all plays into how this goes down. So everybody should be able to verbalize how we can look at the best way or the safest way to lift and move the patients. Hmm, is there a back door? Is there an alternate way? Again, drug dosing, drug calculations, drug routes. Decisions on transport destination. Okay, maybe this patient should go to a trauma center. Maybe the paramedic is very focused on this patient and they're trying to establish an IV and get two or three things done. However, they haven't had a big chance to really look at the vehicle and may not have realized that the patient lost consciousness. Maybe they never heard that. Maybe that wasn't effectively communicated to them. But somebody came over and told the EMT that while the paramedic was getting the IV started, um, when she first was out of the car, when the fire department pulled up, she was out in the ditch and she was unconscious. And there's possibility of a head trauma here. Well, at this point, that again needs to be communicated among the other members of the team to the paramedic to make a better decision on transport destination. 
rhythm interpretations. I've already mentioned there are plenty of times. You'll print a rhythm strip. You'll take a look at it. You'll say, I think it's this. It looks like that. I'm pretty sure this is what's going on. Really, the, nobody should take your paramedic card away for wanting to get a second opinion on an EKG strip. I have seen ER physicians debating among themselves about what an EKG strip means and what is actually going on inside the patient. So if an ER doc with 20 years can debate it and discuss it with a colleague, I think we should take that and do it ourselves. There's a lot of other situations, and I'm sure you can come up with a bunch that you can think of. Overall, let's look at the big picture. The concept and practice of crew resource management was brought into the aviation field and credited with making it a heck of a lot safer, and it's gone very well over 25 years. Many emergency response agencies are adopting it now, especially larger departments, trying to, again, improve on safety, making sure everyone goes home, making sure that we don't have a flight engineer and a first officer who realize they're running out of fuel while the pilot's working on landing gear, and they end up dying for not communicating effectively. Developing and adopting CRM process takes buy-in from all stakeholders within the organization, and this is a big deal. Not only the big boss and the five bugle chief on the top needs to buy in on it, but also all the middle managers along the way, the company officers, the line officers, the battalion chiefs, in EMS, your shift supervisors, your dispatchers, your dispatch supervisors. We all need to realize that in order for CRM to work, everybody's got to buy into and work within this culture. However, on the other side of that coin, implementing crew resource management can improve and has been proven to improve safety in many public safety as well as the aviation field, and it can make it safer for us as well as other providers. Hey there, I'd like to thank you all for stopping by checking out our video. If you want more information about our company or any of the stuff we do, you can check out our website. If you need EMS Continuing Education Hours, we do have our online education platform posted up there. Also, we have our email address if you have any questions. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Rumble. We maintain channels on all of those. Also, Please like, share this out to your friends, subscribe, help support the channel, and we'll keep putting more videos out there for you. Oh, well, enough about that. I know what I'm up for. Time for a cup of coffee. Y'all have a great day. Be safe out there. Bye.